You may have seen the recent video on YouTube that's gone viral. It's of Zach Walls, who's a 19-year-old University of Iowa student who's speaking to the Iowa House of Representatives. He makes this eloquent and very emotional appeal in favor of same-sex marriage by talking about how he was raised by two lesbian mothers. And uh, as a result of being raised by them, he hasn't been hurt at all. He's just fine, healthy, and well-adjusted. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who can criticize Zach Walls? I mean, if you see the video, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, the, the video is sensational. He does a great job. And you're thinking, what can you say that's negative about him? The truth is, I'm not going to say anything negative about Zach Walls. He's an impressive guy. He's uh, good-looking. He's well-dressed. He was eloquent. He gave a sensational speech. And uh, I'm sure he'd make a great friend as well. The problem is not with Zach Walls. The problem is with the idea that he's advancing. And the credibility of that idea has nothing to do with how well-spoken he is. The idea does not stand or fall based on the delivery of his speech, even though many people are enamored by it. But that's what everybody keeps telling me. Look, look at him. He's so young. He's so intelligent. He's so well thought out. He's so well dressed. He, he speaks so clearly. Look, that might be good enough for the YouTube community, and I'm sure he's gotten a lot of hits. I think uh, the two videos of him combined are, are at least about 17 million views. And so I'm sure he's going to get a lot of likes. But when it comes to matters of public policy, of which he's speaking about, it doesn't matter that he gave a slick speech. What matters is the ideas he's advancing and the reasons he has for those ideas. And so when you see a video like this, you're kind of blown away by the, uh, the strength of the appeal that's being made. And you kind of ask yourself the question, how can I respond to this? It just seems so persuasive, so clear, so uh, well thought out. Now I understand it's difficult, I get that. Um, part of the reason why this is so difficult to deal with is because it's so easy for the other side to kind of make these short, pithy statements that sound so compelling, like, uh, codified discrimination, or uh, we're making us into second-class citizens, or we're denying people uh, the, the right to marry whom they love. And those statements sound so compelling and so true, but the problem is it takes so much energy and, and time to kind of unpack what those statements mean and what's being implied by them, and then to try to respond to them uh, is, is just, frankly, it's difficult. So how are you supposed to respond when you see a video like this or an article like this? Well, here's what I do. First, I just take a deep breath and I listen very carefully to the idea that's being advanced. And I ask myself the question and I write this down. I say, what idea is being advanced and what are the reasons for that idea? And then I just simply analyze those arguments. Now, once you get past this really impassioned appeal that he makes, uh, you can take a sober look at his arguments for changing public policy. And frankly, you'll find that they're not all good arguments. Actually, I take that back. There's one argument that Zach makes very well, and that is this. Zach Walls is a great guy. He's got the credentials to prove it, right? 99 percentile in the ACT, he's an Eagle Scout, he owns and operates his own small business. I mean, I'm twice his age, and I haven't even accomplished all that stuff. So, uh, is he an impressive guy? Absolutely. Would I be proud to have him as a son? Absolutely. But here's what's important to remember. His personal achievements have very little to do with the case for same-sex marriage. But that's the gist of his argument. If gay parents can raise a successful and healthy child, then same-sex marriage should be legal. Zach Walls was raised by gay parents, and he's a healthy and successful child. Therefore, same-sex marriage should be legal. But this reasoning is flawed. You can't answer the question if gay parents can raise a healthy and successful uh, and well-adjusted child by simply looking at Zach Walls. All you can learn by looking at Zach Walls is stuff about Zach. But you can't generalize one person's experience for an entire group of people. Look, you could probably find single mothers out there who have raised healthy, well-adjusted, successful children who have achieved the 99 percentile on, the AT, on their ACT score. Does that mean the single parent families are healthy and the ideal? Does that mean that two parents are not better than one? Or we could even look at orphans who are raised in an institution and probably find someone like Zach Walls. Is it possible they could do that good of a job? That's possible. I'm sure we could find one. But does that mean that an institution does just as good of a job as a mother and a father raising a child? Can we find a healthy and well-adjusted child who owns and operates his own small business, who's been raised by one of the many polygamous families around the world? Well, I bet we can. Does this mean that the United States government should legally sanction polygamous marriages? Of course not, because making laws based on an exceptional case does not make good public policy. And so we shouldn't deconstruct the entire institution of marriage 
in our entire model of parenting just because Zach Walls turned out wonderful. But that's the idea that's being advanced that both a mother and a father are not needed in parenting. In fact, it turns out that mothers and fathers are completely interchangeable. There's no difference between the two. Fathers offer no unique contribution to their role as parents, and mothers, likewise, offer no unique contribution to their role as parents. All that's needed is just two people, right? Just like Zach has his two mommies. Now, besides that being completely counterintuitive, it doesn't even hold up to scientific scrutiny. Now, not that you need a scientist to tell you this, but there is decades of research in sociology, uh, psychology, medicine that scream the importance of having a father as a parent in a family. And it's not just based on a single data point, it's based on an abundance of literature on thousands and thousands of cases of children who are being raised. And this just gives credibility to this common sense notion that fathers play a valuable role in parenting. Do we really want to intentionally design some families to deny children their father? I mean, a, a compassionate and moral society comes to the aid of fatherless children or motherless children. We don't intentionally create families such that they're denied those fathers and mothers, but legalizing same-sex marriage would do just that. Now, one of the things that Zach warns about is that Iowa might be, for the first time in their history, codifying discrimination into the law, into their constitution, and therefore denying people the right to marry whom they love. And, of course, he claims that this uh, makes them into second-class citizens. Now, first of all, he's factually incorrect about this being the first time that discrimination is codified into the law, but I'll get to that in a moment. The more difficult thing to deal with is that he's using this rhetorically loaded language like discrimination without defining his terms or even explaining what he means. Uh, what is discrimination? Well, discrimination is simply making a distinction. And whether or not that distinction is legitimate or not depends entirely upon the distinction that's being made. There's already a kind of discrimination that's built into the Constitution, and in fact in most states' laws. In fact, we routinely discriminate based on age, gender, disability, and many other things. For example, children are denied voting rights. Uh, women are denied access to men's restrooms. The blind aren't allowed to drive cars, and, and I can go on. But notice that we don't complain about this kind of discrimination because we are making appropriate distinctions about what certain people can do and excluding them from certain activities. The blind shouldn't drive because whether they can see or not is relevant to their ability to be able to drive a car safely. And regarding marriage, we've actually codified discrimination into the law long before appeals for same-sex marriage were made. We've already made certain kinds of distinctions about the kinds of relationships that the state is willing to sanction. I can't marry my friend who's a heterosexual male. I can't marry my daughter. Even though we're not sexually involved, I still can't marry her despite the fact that she's a person I love. Does that make the law unjust? Does that make me a second-class citizen? Well, no and no. The law makes a distinction regarding my relationship with my daughter or my uh, male heterosexual friend. Of course, this raises the question, why should we just limit marriage to two people? I mean, if two women can get married, why can't two women and three men get married in a group marriage? Can't they claim that they just simply want to marry the persons they love and they don't want to be second-class citizens either? What right do we have to deny them also a marriage? Now, people always complain when you bring up these examples and say, oh, come on. Who's talking about incestuous marriages? Who's talking about uh, group marriages? Well, that's not what we're dealing with. We're talking here about same-sex marriage. Well, first of all, there are a lot of people talking about group marriage and incestuous marriage and polygamous marriages. In fact, the ACLU is on record talking about this and wanting to defend it, and many other institutions and universities uh, at the highest levels are trying to argue for group marriage and other things like this. But people who complain about these examples that I'm using are missing the bigger problem. The question is, what principled reasons do we have for denying group marriage advocates and polygamists if we are able to say that, hey, look, two men or two women can get married? The Supreme Court Justice of California, when same-sex marriage was legalized here in California, even said in his decision, he says, now that we've kind of opened up the definition of marriage to include two men or two women, we now have no principled objection for denying other advocates of marriage, for example, group marriage advocates, uh, um, incestuous marriage, or polygamists. Why? Because once you open up the definition, it can be defined as anything you like. And that's why this comes down to one issue. Is marriage something we define or we describe? And there's a huge difference between that two. Take food, for example. 
Turns out you can't just define what food is any way you please. Even if you can eat an ashtray, it doesn't make it food. That's because food is what it is regardless of what you call it. And just because you might want to redefine what an ashtray is and define it as food, it doesn't make it so. Instead, food is something you describe. It exists as an objective something that's out there that you recognize and you call it food. And we know it's food because it naturally and appropriately nourishes the body. Human beings are made in a certain kind of way that makes it normal and healthy for them to put food inside their bodies. And so you can't switch out food for something else like pencils or phones or ashtrays. Your body can only run on food. Now with regards to marriage, if it's something that you can just define, well then marriage is completely flexible. You can make it whatever you want. If, on the other hand, marriage is something that's kind of out there, it's something that we describe, well, then we have to kind of zero in on what marriage actually is. And that means we could be right about it or we could be wrong about it. The reality is that marriage is like food. It's something that people have been describing throughout all of civilization. Although we gave marriage a name, naming didn't create it. It always existed. It was always there even before the state existed. And as we look into culture, we see that human beings have been forming these male-female couplings ever since humans have been around. And these couplings, these long-term monogamous heterosexual relationships produced as a group the next generation. That's why marriage is relevant to the state. The state does not define marriage because marriage existed before the state. Marriage is logically prior to the state. So therefore, the state can't redefine what it is. Instead, the state merely looks into culture and recognizes that marriages exist. It recognizes that these heterosexual relationships exist, and then it creates laws that protect and privilege those relationships. Why? Because as a group, they produce the next generation. And marriage has never been solely about marrying the person you love. I mean, you can look at a marriage form, it doesn't ask you, do you love the person you're marrying? Because the state doesn't care. It's not relevant. What the state cares about is producing and protecting the next generation so that civilization can continue in the healthiest way possible. Let me close by saying that Zach's most important claim in his speech is something I completely agree with. Listen to what he says. He says, your family doesn't derive its sense of worth from being told by the state, hey, look, you're married, congratulations. He says, no, the sense of family comes from the commitment we make to each other. It comes from the love that binds us. That's what makes a family, he says. What you're voting here isn't to change us. It's not to change our families. It's to change how the law views us, how the law treats us. This is one point he gets absolutely correct. And in my opinion, this is a rather stunning admission. What he's saying is that the state or the laws don't give same-sex couples anything they can't get on their own. The states or the laws don't define who they are. Instead, changing the law is about making a statement. It's about changing how the culture views gay relationships. They want to change the culture's perception by making the law say there is no difference between heterosexual unions and homosexual unions. It's an attempt to completely deconstruct and recreate our understanding of marriage. And like every other same-sex marriage advocate, Zach asks this a kind of simplistic uh, rhetorical question and that is how will same-sex marriage hurt you? How will same-sex marriage hurt your family or affect you? That is not a question I'm concerned with. The question I'm concerned with is how will same-sex marriage affect our culture in the long term? It's not how does same-sex marriage hurt me. It's how does same-sex marriage hurt the institution of marriage and our culture when we say there is absolutely no difference between heterosexual unions and homosexual unions, when we say there's no difference between a mother and a father, make no mistake about it. If marriage is not something we define, but rather it's something that we describe, then we are doing violence to marriage if we redefine it. Just like we're doing violence to our bodies when we eat an ashtray. Same-sex marriage won't hurt you or me today, but you can't take a sledgehammer to the core of civilization, the family, and expect that no harm will come.